either you are new to software engineering or you're just starting to build your first projects in Go and you don't know which project architecture to use, you've heard of these terms clean architecture, DDD, hexagonal architecture and if all of this sounds confusing then this video is for you because I'm going to help you clarify everything. I'm going to teach you in a way that I haven't seen no one teach and if you get it you'll be way more confident as an engineer and all I ask you is that if you liked this video, if it provided any value, consider subscribing to the channel because there are more videos like this there and coming in the future as well. So a couple of years ago, I struggled myself with these terms and architectures and I was seeing everyone else talking about them like propaganda. But if I would go back, I would tell myself and others beginners and intermediates that you should not limit yourself with these architectures because they are just one way of organizing the solution to your problem. They are not the way of doing it, right? And beginners and intermediates really choke on this. I don't know the theory behind clean architecture or domain-driven design. Still, I use it on pretty much all the softwares I work. Heck, even on my videos, I use it all of the time. How come, right? Because, you see, the most common pattern behind all of these architectures and the reason they exist in the first place is that they are looking for a logical and a clean way of separation of concerns in your system. That's it. So you, as the developer, don't create a spaghetti mess in your code and we all have created spaghetti mess in our code, right? And that's part of the fun. But you don't need to know the theory or all of these coin terms out there in order to build clean and sustainable software because I'm going to teach you how to achieve these based on timeless principles instead of having to buy a 400 page book like this one you're going to become a pragmatic engineer that can think by themselves and won't choke when there is a use case that the architecture didn't cover now don't get me wrong because these architecture here are very important, they are the basis of modern enterprise software but you should only learn them after you understand why you need them and after learning the basic principles that I'm going to tell you. Before we get to the principles, let me show you first a real world example on how you would structure for example your uh, API server or something like that. So here we have the user browser and he makes a request to get the user 42 for example. So we are exposing an HTTP API in this API server. So how would we structure this? And based on the principle that we already know, which is that we should separate all of these concerns. So the business logic should be separate from the transport layer, which in this case is going to be the HTTP and should also be separate from the uh, storage layer, for example. So let's first divide the different layers of the application that we have. So the first one is going to be the transport layer, which is what we're going to use for the HTTP. So we're going to expose the HTTP transports. We could also expose the gRPC, something like that. And that is the way that we deliver the message to the consumer. Then we have the service layer. This is where all of the business logic is. And finally, you would have also the storage layer in a typical REST API. Uh, the storage is once abstracts away the communication between the storage and the data fetching that we have on our service. So let's compose this here. So when we get the request for the user 42, this is going to be on the transport layer. Let's say that the request comes in and it's going to hit our HTTP handlers. And here we have everything related to the routing, to the endpoint definition of that. And then the HTTP handler is going to call the service. So this is going to be the, let's say, service dot get users and this is going to be injected this is going to be a service that's going to be injected into the http handler so it would look something like this and here we are injecting the service layer so if you had to communicate with the user service you'd inject it if you'd have to communicate with let's say the the user addresses service you could inject it here as well and why would we want to do this why would we want to inject these dependencies and all of this boils down to not having to depend on the implementation but on the abstract level so we could depend on a service layer interface so let's say in the going project you have an interface for a service instead of depending on a struct you depend on the interface and that allows you to inject multiple implementations of that service 
And this is very useful when you are doing testing because you can just inject a mock implementation of that service. And then you could also inject the storage layer. This is one of the things that you would inject on this service because the service talks to the storage layer and it doesn't talk to the HTTP layer. So you would have a cascading of layers like so. So the request comes in, hits the transport layer, communicates with the service layer and with the storage. And and this is pretty much clean architecture, to be honest. As long as you have a clean separation of concerns, you are good to go and you don't need to do all of those crazy and fancy folder architectures that you see online. And here, let me just finish the drawing. You'd have the storage dot finds user by ID. And this, what would happen is you'd go to the database layer and fetch the user from there. And this would communicate to the service, which would communicate to the HTTP handler. And the HTTP handler is responsible for encoding this into JSON and sending this to the user as a JSON message. So I have just made the drawing a little bit more pretty so we can understand it. Uh, can screenshot it if you want. But basically, the main takeaway is that you should separate your programs into layers that you can logically separate between them. And this makes your whole code, your whole code base testable uh, and future proof. Because if the business comes to you and asks for a new requirement in the business logic, all you need to do is go to the business logic and change it. And all of these layers here don't need to be changed. And you're not going to have a spaghetti code by the end. Now, let me show you a code example of this that I'm working on a project for a video for you guys in the future. This here, it's a microservice architecture project. So basically I have multiple services here that are completely deployed separately. And here I have a Docker Compose that orchestrates all of these services. And let's take a look at, for example, the order service. I think it's the one that has the most code. And as you can see, just by looking at this, this is very simple. I have just started this a few days ago, so it's not very complex, but I'm slowly building up. And as you can see, I have a service, I have a storage layer, and I have also the handler. And I also have a gRPC because this exposes both HTTP and gRPC for inter-service communication. And basically what I have here is on the main, I construct all of these pieces, all of these layers. So I have here a store construction. Basically I create this store and then I inject the store into the service. So the service takes the store has a dependency and then the service is injected into the handler. Now, if you take a look at the store, it's pretty simple. So here I just have an in-memory array or a slice. Um, this is going to be replaced by a database, but I'm going to slowly do that as we go. Uh, I'm going to show you this on the video as well. Uh, so the service then receives this store, has a dependency. This store here is an interface and it's not an implementation. So as you can see, this is the signature for the interface. Then here on the service, this is the implementation of that interface. So here we have the business logic for the create order. So as you can see, we prepare the input for the storage. So this is what I'm going to send to the storage engine, which in this case, as we've seen, is just a slice. Uh, and then here on the handler, basically we call this validate order, which is as well another method of the service. Uh, validate order checks if the items are empty and then it calls another service to see if the items are in stock or not and then here on the handler after we validate the order we create it using the service again and here at the end of the create order handler i am communicating with an external message broker in this case it's rabbitmq it could be anything it could be kafka and if i would change the business logic for the validation order for example we would need to change um, that the minimum input for the items would be two. So all we need to do is change here on the service because this is the realm of the business logic. So we have pretty much just touched on all of these principles. And now I'm gonna tell you what are them. So the first one is the separation of concerns. We have already talked about this one. So each level in your program should be a separate by a clear barrier. So the transport layer, the service layer, and the storage layer, for example. Then we have dependency inversion principle. This is a bit more complex to explain, but the clear, the most clear explanation that I can give you is that you are injecting the dependencies in your layers instead of calling them directly. Why? Because this promotes loose coupling and it makes it easier for you to test your layers. Then we have the ability to change or the 
ease of change of your code. So by organizing your code in a more modular and flexible way, you can more easily introduce new features, refactor existing code and respond to evolving business needs. Your systems should be easy to change because if you have to change a lot of code to add a new feature or change existing code at all, then you are doing something wrong. And this is something that you see a lot in Code Clean from Uncle Bob. Uh, he talks about this a lot and it's really important when you are doing production code because as the project goes, if it becomes more expensive to add the new feature, then the business decreases in value and it's going to be more expensive for them to do anything. And finally, focus on business value because at the end of the month, it's your customers who pay your bills. So focus on delivering your software first to your users and then make it better as you go. And what does all of this have to do with your projects? It has to do everything because when you start a new project, you might be thinking which architecture should I use? Instead, you should be thinking how can I solve the problem? So if you're building an API, how can I solve this problem? Which endpoints do I need? How I'm going to structure this? It's the second priority that you should have. First, solve it and then think about how you're going to architecture all of this because when you have all of the components laid out, you have your database schema, you know how many services and all of that, then you can think which is the most appropriate architecture. And even if you don't want to use an existing architecture, you can separate things by layers and you're going to be good to go as well. So by using these principles here and probably there are a couple more, but this is the ones that I think are most important. You will be building software that actually solves problems instead of creating more problems down the line. Because when you are blindly following someone else's work and you don't really understand the principles behind it, and you arrive at the place at your project that the initial author didn't thought of, then you're going to choke. Or you might even follow everything, always working, you have a beautiful project working, solving the business value, but you have a simple server, a simple hell world, with 30 files and 10 folders. So let me know what you guys think and let me know if in the comments, if I helped you demystify all of these buzzwords. Um, after you understand these basic principles, you can go ahead and start reading the works of Uncle Bob and all of that, all of those books. And so consider subscribing or liking the video if you liked it. And I see you on the next one.